But now that same tongue, because of sin, also is capable of blasphemy. It's football season. I love this time of year. I think I'm probably not alone in this room. I'm also a huge Dallas Cowboys fan. I know, some of you are shaking your head. Yeah, somebody over here in the corner who shall not be named might be crying for me. But that actually brings up exactly what I kind of wanted to talk about with the Cowboys. See, every offseason, the Cowboys become this amazing Super Bowl-bound team. The sports writers talk about how incredible they're going to be. They look really good. They've got all the right tools. They've got all the right people in the right places, the personnel, the coaching staff. It all looks great. There's no way they're not winning a championship. And you know what? For the first game of the season, it actually looked really, really good. 40 to nothing win over a, uh, a division rival was beautiful. Now, uh, a few weeks ago, we also had a game against another team that we lost to in the playoffs last year. And you know what? I was super pumped for this game. Sunday night game. I'm excited. I'm not going to go watch it with Ryan because we'll just be at each other all night long. But uh, so I'm sitting in my house. Game starts. Kick off. I'm all into it. You know, let's go. Come on. Go hit somebody. Throw a touchdown pass. Let's do it. Right. And, and I go that way for a while. But then things start not going the Cowboys way. And let's just, let's put it this way. By the end of the game, while Ryan was probably cheering out of his seat and maybe dancing on his couch, uh, I was literally kneeling on the floor wondering, how did this all go wrong? And saying things like, ugh, Dak Prescott can't hit the broad side of a barn. I don't know why we stick with this guy. McCarthy, overrated. Yeah, great, you won a Super Bowl years ago with Green Bay, who cares? This team will never win as long as Jerry Jones is the owner. Period. Full stop. Okay? So, obviously, my speech pattern has changed significantly. I'm a huge Cowboys fan, don't get me wrong. But we have, there's a huge change that's occurred through 60 minutes worth of football. In 60 minutes worth of football, I've gone from mega fan to these guys stink. I don't even know why I follow them. Okay? It's amazing how fast our speech can turn from building up to tearing down. Now, the Dallas Cowboys don't care about what I say about them, and they really shouldn't. Uh, but you know who does care about the words that come out of my mouth? Aside from my wife, who has the misfortune of having to listen to me during these games. Jesus cares. In Matthew 12, 33 through 37, we see him talking to the Pharisees, and he says, Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad, for the tree is known by its fruit. You brood of vipers, how can you speak good when you are evil? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The good person out of his good treasure brings forth good, and the evil person out of his evil treasure brings forth evil. I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be justified, and by your words, you will be condemned." So he's pointing out an issue of a heart when we start here, right? See, the Pharisees have this, this notion that the fruit being good renders the tree itself as good. But that's not correct thinking. See, a bad tree, I think we all know, a bad tree does not produce good fruit. It just withers and dies. Jesus is talking about our heart condition, and it has to start there, inside us. Verse 34 really captures it. it. says, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. See, good brings forth good, and evil brings evil. We will be condemned or justified by our words. They're representative of our character, who we are in our heart. 
If our words are careless or evil, we're just as they are. But if our words are good, then it reflects the goodness of our character. However, before we just live on that, we already know we're a fallen creation. And as fallen creatures, our character suffers from the flaw of sin. And because of that, our speech is actually the inverse of God's speech. And it wasn't always this way. We can see that in the beginning in Genesis, when God brings all the creatures to Adam, and Adam speaks their name. Genesis 2.19 says, Now out of the ground the Lord had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. So at the start of the world, before the fall, Adam uses his speech in a good and holy way by working in conjunction with God for his glory. Now, obviously, that doesn't last very long, right? We, Adam and Eve eat the forbidden fruit. There's the fall. The rest is history. Now, because of that, that sin, we have a fallen nature, and that taints our speech patterns that were intended to emulate God's. See, we're made in His image, and through our sin, we're now capable of blasphemy. So what began with us being built in His image and having the ability to build up with our speech, right? I mean, we had the right to name every living creature, but now that same tongue because of sin, also is capable of blasphemy against God. God uses speech to build us up while also tearing down falsehoods. And we're using it to tear down others while propping ourselves up as being more holy and righteous. It's a pride thing. It's a, we create this kind of this sin ladder, right, where we all want to be the best, and so we speak judgment on others to build ourselves up. We know that we've all fallen short of the glory of God through our sin. But we kind of view it through the lens of this competitive ladder to be climbed. Let's think about it. Like, how do we judge people, right? Like, we've all watched the news and maybe we've seen somebody accused of murder and we think to ourselves, glad I'm not that guy. So much better than him, you know? It's not a sin I've ever committed, um, and nor would I. Uh, we might talk negatively about a coworker to others, right? We're having that water cooler talk, and we're like, oh, man, did you see Dustin last week? You see the mistake he made? <laughs> Pity that guy. Wait till the boss finds out. I'm way better at this than he is. Last, last weekend... Uh, I watched the final match of my son's soccer season. We won five to nothing. It, it was a tough game for the other team for sure. But at one point, the opposing coach, uh, they get this free kick, you know, and the opposing coach starts yelling at the kids to get up. And everybody's kind of, they're kind of moving, but they're not really moving. And so all of a sudden, he literally yells out, come on, guys, get your stuff together. Whew. And seventh and eighth grade coach. I know I'm better than that guy. I've coached kids. I have never said anything like that to any of the kids. Sometimes we actually take the opposite tactic of that. Instead of, you know, judging others, we'll judge ourselves. How many of you guys have ever said something, you know, about yourself like, oh, you know, I'm not really very good at that, even though you know you're good at it? But you just desperately need somebody to tell you how good you are, right? We've, I mean, we've probably all had moments where we've been like, I really need somebody to prop my ego up right now, so I'm going to talk bad about myself. That way somebody will. Sometimes it's just a matter of thirsting so much for approval that if I'm not hearing it enough, I'll tear myself down just so others will build me up. My ego needs it. I'm still better than those other sinners, though, right? I mean, my sins, they're the smaller ones, right? Yeah, right? I mean, my halo certainly shines brighter 
than a lot of other people out there. But that's not true at all. Sin is sin. And God judges them all the same. Really, only we use it as a way to appear more righteous, somehow holier than others. Jesus calls out this type of speech in Matthew 7, 1 through 5. He starts off by saying, Judge not that you will not be judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite, first take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Our pronounced judgment of others is obviously dangerous, as we see in verse 2. By our own judgment, we are setting the standards by which we will be judged. That's a scary thought. Let's also note the word pronounce. This is us speaking out loud. That's what pronouncing is. And clearly, our fallen speech continues to plague us. In verses 3 through 5, Jesus points out how ridiculous we are by comparing a speck to a log in terms of the sin we suffer versus the one we're quick to point out about others. Not only how ridiculous, but how we pretend to be morally superior to others through seeing and pointing out their sin rather than fixing our own. We're not alone in our fallen use of speech, right? I mean, this isn't a modern day issue. This has been happening forever. The Bible's rife with examples of people that we do and don't look up to who exhibit this inverted speech pattern. Let's talk about some of the reasons why we're motivated to do this. All right, so first up, pride. We see the Pharisees use speech in prideful ways all the time. Uh, Jesus points to them in Matthew 6, 5, just before he introduces the Lord's Prayer. And when you pray... You must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. So don't be like the hypocrites. Don't shout out your pretend praises and prayers in public. It's just vanity. The Pharisees aren't directing their praise to God at all. This isn't, this isn't going vertical up to God. This is going horizontally out. These are prayers meant for others to look at them and to think, oh man, I wish I was like that Pharisee, so obviously holy and righteous. And it gets worse. Not only are they making these prayers out so that men will recognize how great they are, but they're also flaunting the fact that they have the direct line to God. Everyone else has to come to them at that time for a relationship with God. It's kind of the old school version of virtue signaling, albeit at an extremely exclusive level. We still do this today through social media. We see it all the time where we support some cause that we don't know anything about. Look at me. I support this cause or that cause because it's popular. And I just want to be seen by others so that I can also be popular. I'm not going to name causes. There's a billion of them out there. All of us are guilty of it at one point or another, picking one, riding along with it. Another way we invert God's speech pattern is fear. In 1 Samuel, we see that Saul was fearful of David. So fearful that not only did he try to kill him many times, but he even berated his own son, Jonathan, over it. 1 Samuel 20, 30 says this, Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, do I not know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? This comment comes right after Jonathan's explained to, Dave, or, uh, to Saul 
why David is absent from, absent from the king's table. At the end of all this, there's a little bit of back and forth between Saul and Jonathan. It ultimately winds up with Saul throwing a spear at his son. I cannot imagine speaking to Nicholas or Kaylee this way, let alone uh, about my wife to them. And I certainly can't imagine throwing a spear at either of them. It's some seriously offensive language from Saul. But Saul knows the situation between him and God. And instead of repentance and acceptance, he allows his fear to drive him to lash out at those around him. He trusts no one, not even his own son. Once those words are out, they can't be called back. Even had he not thrown that spear, the words alone had already done the damage. Before we dive into defensive use of speech, I just want to be really real here. This is not a great feel-good sermon, and I apologize for that. But I do want you to know that by the time we get to the end of it, there's good news. And there's better news when you show up next week, and Dave gives a speech on when we speak with the Holy Spirit. All right, so let's talk about defensive use of speech. In Genesis 4-9, we see God speaking to Cain. This is right after Cain has attacked and killed Abel. It says, Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is Abel your brother? And Cain replies, I do not know. Am I my brother's keeper? We can, kinda, we can hear this like in his voice, right? Like Even though we're reading the words, we can tell right away. Cain's got that, not my problem, not my responsibility. Don't hold me accountable for this guy. I don't know where he went, and I'm certainly not responsible to answer to you. See, he responds super defensively in his guilt. And honestly, I've done this before. I never never killed my brother. He's still, still alive. But I have responded defensively when asked about something that I know I'm guilty of. Uh, usually it winds up being over a purchase that I might have made without having a conversation with my wife. I just want to clarify, that's not like a $10 coffee at, at Dutch Brothers, okay? I'm talking about more like $100 or more at Sportsman's Warehouse. Maybe an online purchase that just shows up in the mail. What's that, she asks. She knows. Uh, what's what I say? I also know. That, she insists and points at it. Uh, nothing. I respond. Don't worry about it. I get defensive and try to cover it up, just like Cain did. Maybe not quite as bad as Cain, but still pretty bad. Pretty bad. It's so harmful, right? I mean, it breaks down the trust and relational harmony in order to maintain this lie that everything's fine and my place on the sin ladder is still secure. I haven't done anything wrong here. It was my money. Oh, let's go on. (laughs) Boasting. Man, yeah, sometimes we use that, right? So we see this in Matthew 26, 35. Jesus has just told Peter, that he would deny even knowing him. Peter responds, Even if I must die with you, I will not deny you. And all the disciples said the same. So before we get too hard on Peter, let's also remember that every other disciple in the room was also like, Me too! See, we focus on Peter's response, and we oftentimes ignore that the rest of them were all in that same, same room, ready to go, We're going to do the same thing, even if we must die. That doesn't even last the full night. We see Matthew 26, 56 point out that after Jesus is arrested, they all flee. No one stayed. We boast all the time as well because we've identified our position on this ladder. And we know through our own ability, 
we can maintain that status. I am the best at the board game risk. I never lose. Right, son? <laughs> or, also really bad, I can bring them to Christ. Through my words to them, they'll see the truth and be saved. We know that none of these things are true. Uh, quite simply, it's impossible for us to tame our speech, to stop our tongue from saying things we should not. And James summarizes this in James 3, 7 through 10. For every kind of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil, full of deadly poison. With it, we bless our Lord and Father, and with it, we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not to be so. No human being can tame the tongue. It's full of deadly poison. So, what are we to do? In our current state, we're dead. We can do nothing. But Jesus chose to make us alive. In James 1.18, of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. James is speaking here about regeneration a new birth by which God chose to renew us. This is where God's pattern of speech is reintroduced again. He speaks truth to build us up and produce good fruit, like we saw back in Matthew 12, 33. We need this renewal so that the tree will be good and, by its goodness, produce good fruit. In this renewal, this regeneration, James points out, what will save us in verse 21. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Now, it's super easy to focus on the first part of that and be like, got it. That's it. I'm going to put away all my filthiness. Time to package up that DVD collection. And... Get rid of the rampant wickedness, okay? So I'll just stop saying bad things. It's simple, right? And I'll do better. No. That's not it at all. See, we are saved by the presence of Jesus, the Word, in our hearts. The Holy Spirit grafts God's Word, Jesus, onto our heart. And this becomes that implanted word. Now, I want to I talk about this word implanted for just a second here, okay? Because uh, I, don't, I don't know that we hear it that much uh, outside, of, outside of this verse. I, I certainly don't hear it in my day-to-day -day at work. Uh, as I was looking through the commentary here, there was a lot of conversation about scattering, right? So think about this like, you know, like a farmer, right? Uh, you go out, you plow a field... And then you come in after it and you just scatter seed everywhere. You're just throwing it all out there and just hoping that come September, you have this amazing harvest, right? But for anybody here who actually does gardening, you guys know that that's not how this works. Uh, we have planter boxes in our, our front yard and my wife, I'm saying my wife because I am not good at this and I don't have the patience for it, but she does. And she goes out and she very deliberately prepares the soil, puts the spot in the ground that she's gonna plant the seed or the starter, covers it back up, and then is diligent to water it and to care for it for months until we have fruit that can be taken from the plant and is good to eat. That's what's happening here, right? 
This isn't Jesus just being like, you know what? (laughs) Holy Spirit everywhere. You all get it, maybe, kind of. I don't know if it caught any of you, but, you know, that's what scattering does, right? It just throws stuff out, and we just... We just try to see, well, hmm, let's see what happens. That is not it. That's not it at all. This is an implanting. This is a deliberate action that is occurring here. This is Jesus coming into your heart, making the hole, putting the word into it, covering it up, sealing it into your heart. Okay? It's important. It's what saves our souls. Through this and the reception of it, we find salvation. Salvation that's good both now and at the final judgment. Only the Spirit can change our speech. We just need to open ourselves up to it and let it take root in our hearts. 